and move A and then an exam of Puerto Rico. And just to give you a feeling of what I was doing in the 60s. So I was very fortunate. I, I finished my master's in basic degrees in New South Wales. I think it's then on the own in Australia and famous in New South Wales. And I uh, knew I needed to look at the deep ocean and its sediments. And I wrote a letter to Morris Ewing, it was director of the Lamont Geological Institute of Ocean at the time, the Prime University. And he wrote back, and I said to him, I thought that if I got a good project to go to, and then somebody might pay some of my fees for living, I'd get a full ride. That would be very simple. You've done it. You've got a letter from me. So I went back to the Fulbright Committee and they said, fantastic. So off I went and I had my travel from the Fulbright thing and I had my Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellowship from Columbia University and I arrived in a snowstorm in October at this time in Idlewild Airport. That's what it was called then. It's Kennedy was still alive. And we arrived there and I went out to Lamont, which was Situated in Sillies, you know, you know, you very well. You go across the George Washington Bridge, you hang up right, you go and walk there, 15 miles and nine levels. And there it sits on the banks, West Bank of the Hudson River, originally the Lamont Estate, owned by the Lamont family, and then did, uh, who worked with geophysics and Morris Newman became the first director. He was a very iconic character, he was born. In, uh, in 1904, he's Texan and he's a tall fellow. Um, knew what he was about. And he, when I went into his office, he said, Johnny said, How old do you think the seafloor is? First question, right? Did you have a chance to say anything? How old is the seafloor? No, no, no. So I'm sitting there, I'm going, ah. Well, I think it's on the chunk. Is how old do you think it is? In other words, how really old do you think it is? So I'm sure this is the correct answer. Well, I didn't know how old it was in terms of being really old at that time. But I soon learned very quickly that it was younger than I thought. And so that was my introduction to my journey. Um, can I well, I'm just slide a thing? I don't have a slide thing. It's coming. What? Make a noise. There's a large one on me. Anyway. Yeah. We can just push a button if you like. If there's over there, someone. Uh, yeah. So okay. might actually have to talk closer yeah, to this. this. Yeah. No. When, yeah. Don't need this. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which one did you push that one? Yeah. Good. Okay, Morris Ewing now. They really put the Vermont Geological Observatory, which is now the Vermont Geology Observatory. They really built it around this like one in page. Um and the first thing that he did, he had worked in the Second World War in Sonar for the US Navy, and he was quite an expert on, on that style of tube physics. But the first thing he did was, whoops, what happened? Oh, we got this now, so this is forward, this is back. First thing he did was to, to buy a vessel so that they could, investigate the deep ocean floor. That's what it was all about. And uh, they bought a ship, an old ship, an old schooner, used to be a luxury cruiser, for $200,000. And eventually that ship, the Vima, sailed a million nautical miles for Lamont collecting data before it was finally commissioned off. It's a long way. So if you were to look at a map now of where deep ocean cores are or deep ocean photographs or records of that kind, it's the Vena 
where it's important to find, you find the V sign all over the place, all over the world. They went into every ocean. It's amazing. It left the docks up the road from Lamont near the Tatman Sea Bridge just after Christmas and came back just before Christmas. And the crew, they used to have 28-day cruises and they'd go around the world. And they did that for years and years and years and collected an enormous amount of data. <laughs> Soon find out, then I. So there was another ship that they used. I mean, I'm talking about the ships because without them, there was nothing. The other ship they got was called the Conrad. It was a Conrad class ship from the Navy, and it was similar size to the to the Vima. They were about 200 foot long, not long, weighed something <laughs> like 10. 10,000 tons or so, a bit more, 10 to 15,000 tons. They were very, very close to the water when you're working on the deck, which is important. Uh, so the other ship they had was the Conrad. That also did about a million nautical miles, collecting data. So my job when I arrived, as Morris Shearing said to me, was. John, you're a sedimentologist, which I was. He said, we well, want you to work on the course. Well, by then, 1963, they had collected, I don't know, I'm guessing 2,000 cores or more from around the world. And there wasn't much work done on them. <laughs> so the core laboratory, which sat about 50 meters from where I was living on campus, was there, it was like opening up Pandora's box, you know? And and they were stored in these these trays, cut in two, stored in these trays. And here I am there as a youngster with Miles Ewing with his white hair in the background, standing next to me, looking at some cores in this case. They're about 12 foot long. These were cores actually from the Puerto Rico trench. Now that's yet again another story. I got on very well with Morris Shearing because he kind of was like isolated from the oceanographic building where Bruce Hazen was and they were competitors and quite different personalities and different funding. And, you know, I think about him a lot because he kept going to the bathroom because I didn't realize he had prostate problems, didn't he? And so he always had to have a bathroom close to him. I mean, I, all these funny things come back as you get older. I don't want to know if you got the bathroom <laughs> Anyway, he had a, he lived in a mon hall and um, and he was he was full of ideas. And with him, I was I well, he would say to me, like, uh, I think we can look at the cores from the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Go and talk to David Erickson, who was a former nipple paleontologist. He's got all the sand fractions and little vials from the, all of these cores across the Atlantic Ocean. I think there's something there that you might find interesting. And there was there was a special kind of wooden building with David Erickson, bless his heart, a lovely guy. And he had each core had a sand fraction and a little vial. You know, so you could say, oh, this call number Vima 16.2 or something. And then you see uh, going down the core in depth. And it's quite obvious when you start looking at these cores that, you know, there was a core of a full of gobbler dryers and formanifera. And then suddenly you'd see the sand fraction come in. And eventually there'd be almost no gobbler dryers, but it'd all be sand, grit. And so these were glaciers. They came out of the Laurentian Channel from Canada, dropping their debris out into the deep ocean ooze. And you could see the glacial marine zones. Just in one or two cores, you could see them come and go, just like that, just with inspection of the virus by themselves. So very quickly, we wrote a paper about the glacial marine zones in the North Atlantic. I mean, it took about two weeks. That's all we had to do is look at these things document them and we had it we 
he didn't know exactly how old they were, but close to the you know, late prices, the top, the top of the sequel. So that's a good example. What kind of paradise I'd arranged logged into? Because I had all this ridiculous Australian experience looking at thin sections and sediments and stuff like that. And they didn't have a sediment file just there. They had people that were doing oceanography, people that went to sea a lot, uh, people that were studying chemistry, uh, currents. There were a number of graduate students, some of which became quite famous. And there was one in particular called Charlie Hollison, who I became very good friends with. In fact, uh, I have with me here, what do I do with it? Here it is. This is typical of the kind of work that came out of the month. This is the book called, I brought it with me, an old bad copy called The Face of the Deep. And this is really by Hazen and Hollister. This book was constructed up to remember watching those two men, Hollister, the graduate student, doing his PhD, which took seven years, which is what it always took when he went to the month. He was too busy writing papers to do it in his dissertation. Um, they, Hazen had a, a little resident sitting on the West Banks of the Hudson River, looking right at it. And he would go down there and they'd have their whole living room and quite a large area, strewn with deep sea photographies, little printed photographs of the whole of the world almost, oceans. And they went through it and through it and through it. And Hollister eventually compiled the whole thing. And it became this book called The Face of the Deep, which was really based on photographs taken by the Vima and Conrad of the deep sea floor. They had two winches, had a big winch to do the coring, had a small winch on the, on the ports, on the starboard side, which, uh, well, what side have I gone, which one was that, which did the court, which did the photography. You sit there with a small winch and you'd have a, a bottom of the camera and you'd sit there and the ship would be rocking away and it just, you'd have a little trigger. You know, so many feet above sea floor bottom. When that hit the ground, it took a shot. So what you would do is you would sit there with your handle on this thing, which is 5,000 meters of cable, and you wait for you to get the kick, and then you'd be able to pull it up again. A little change in pressure, you could actually feel it as it hit the bottom, and you pull it up and ship the go a further, take another photograph. So this book, The Face of the Deep, Hayden was very good at constructing but with the English language. Uh, that's the kind of title he would have picked. The face of the deep, you know. I mean, who would have thought of that? The deep, you know, it was the face of the deep. And so that book is an icon. And if you wanted to know about the world C4, <laughs> a very quick review, read that. It might take you a month or two to digest it, but it's a fantastic uh, relic from a hell of a lot of work. Anyway, so oh, here we are. Here's Bruce. Uh, so that was the next slide. It was yes. So I work fairly closely with Bruce. Um, that globe, which is this globe, was one that he basically put together from scratch with his partner, Marie Tharp. Marie Tharp, who was not only his partner, but his girlfriend, uh, they lived together, never got married, long story. Um, had side-by-side side -by -side offices and they had ships tracks going all the way across, say, the Atlantic Ocean. And they looked at the ship's tracks. I'll just go a few more slides. Going backwards, I'm sorry. Let's go a few more. Well, just, here we are. Oops, went one too far. There's Bruce on the left, of course, with the globe, and there 
is Marie Tharp sitting in her office with a, a fairly large map of the uh, North Atlantic Ocean, western part of it. And there behind her, you can see echo sounding records all black and out of transects across, basically across the Mid Oceanic Ridge. She was the one that first recognized by doing this kind of work in the North Atlantic that the Mid Oceanic Ridge had, in fact, a rift valley in the middle of it. And of course, they had a lot of seismicity going on at Lamont. There was a big building with a seismic pupil. In it. And they soon found out that, of course, it was seismically active. And so this was one of the first clues they had that they had a mid oceanic ridge, the rift valley in the middle was seismically active. This was before, just before they recognized the reversals on each side of it matched. That came kind of later, right? So here we are, here's Marie, it's a very young lady. And you can see the snow outside the windows there. There's obviously winter time. And there's Bruce with his saddles there, the two of them pointing at that map. Now, those maps were made by looking at the echo sounding records. And she actually drew the topography by hand on a big piece of plume. And all done by hand. So this map, the one that she's looking at, was built from ocean echo sounding records from scratch by hand. And it wasn't done with computers or anything. I, I find this, I mean, they were doing that when I arrived in the, in 63 and 64. And they'd already made the map of the North Atlantic and the map of the South Atlantic. And they were starting to work on the Indian Ocean at that stage. The Pacific Ocean was last on the list because scripts looked after that. At University of California, so kind of didn't bother them very much by intruding on the ground. Anyway, so very interesting times. Now I'm just going to, I've got to do something here. There's a pointer. This is a video, but I don't know how to get it um, up there. It's supposed to have an arrow on it, which I can push. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Is it dead? If I... No, there it is. Okay. Here's the arrow. A severe earthquake shook the Grand Banks off Newfoundland. Okay, that's the volume. International telegraph cable. Can we get the volume up? That's as loud as it goes, unfortunately. Is this the glass we're going to go? Yeah. Oh. Really? Yeah. Really? Yes. This is earthquake. No. So, okay. Thirteen computers these days are not very Thank good. United States with Europe were broken for a distance of uh, hundred miles to the south. Well, it's on my stick where he talks normal. After another, he's describing along a two hundred mile length until at thirteen hours. The Grand Banks earthquake, after the earthquake of nine twenty nine, cable broke, which broke all these submarine cables as they went. It was our hub with down the same thing that happened in the in the abyssal plain. I'm sorry about that. Namely, the suspension of mud and water, known as a turbidity current, which flowed at tremendous you know, velocity down the globe, really tearing down these big loads. Really so, right? Here we are with a lecture, and I can't get the sound to go up. Oh. The obvious way was to find that similar deposits were found south of the Grand Banks as we had already found in the Hudson Canyon. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years later, we were able to get a ship well, I could hear to go computer. out and take a core, a series of cores, in fact, of which this is representative. That's Bruce Eisen, of course. And these cores showed an upper layer about a meter thick of silt and sand, and then abrupt break and ooze below. The ooze of the same kind that Challenger Expedition had described in the late part of the 19th century. We had the evidence from the cores. We had the analogy with the other canyons. And geological theory at that point was ripe. So a revolution in thinking was born. And from then on, there was really no doubt that the great abyssal plain, they were formed by these floodings of silt and sand 
the uh, result of the turbidity current. <laughs> this is just a diagram. Between <laughs> <laughs> yeah. brief episodes of turbidity current sedimentation, the slow, steady rain of pelagic sediment continues unabated. No way of getting it louder. Uh, the only way would be to play it through the main computer, which would take some time. We could do that through the computer. This immense wedge of sediment at the foot of the slope I is the continental rise. Huh? I can give it a go and try to plug it in. Yeah, so why don't you try? All right. I mean, it's yeah. hard for having things that are really important. Yes. If you can't hear them, right? This is one of the reasons why I want you to do a lecture the day before. That's just a slide. Yeah, that's just a slide as it sort of goes through. Yeah. Just describe it, John, because it's not leaking in there. Well, yeah, I don't know where. Try and try. I think we're going back to Fan A. Okay. What's happening? You, you switch slide. Okay, well, one of the things we. What's that black thing up there? You know? Yeah, I'm closing it now. Good, it's gone. Thank you. Right, one of the things that Bruce Hayes and I worked on was a suite of cores taken down the Laurentian Channel between Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And the interesting thing about it was these cores are about 12 metres long up to 12 metres long piston cores. Pretty routine. Ewing used to say, core a day. That was his rule. Stop the ship. Four of that, right? So we didn't always do that, but they they did do a couple of hundred cores every year. So they had cores all over the place. And these cores were, as you can see from Vima, crews 16 and 17. And uh, they were taking down the guts of the Laurentian Channel. And what we had there were Holocene, grey, silty, clay, goop. But Underneath the brownish layer with the beady was a red brick, what we call a kill. It was full of glacial marine, red, green wort, Permian and Carboniferous red sandstones, which had probably come out of the base of the channel uh, when the ice sheet went out. And it went out. And it went back again as it retreated. So we had two red brick tills that showed the ice sheet prograding and regrading in the whole in the late Pleistocene. That was a, that was a long paper that we wrote with all kinds of stuff and it published in the Journal of Geology. But it was just one good example. Interesting that that red brick sediment continued its pathway down the continental slope into the North Atlantic as well. So, you know, that's another part of the story which we worked on, which wasn't published at this time. Oops. Anyway, there's the channel. Thickness of the sediment, obviously thick in the middle. And the core is going down. Going down along it. And there was a movie that we can't hear, which is important, but we can't hear it. What did it say? Um, In a nutshell, what does it say? Uh, it said that in 1929, the Grand Banks earthquake cut all these cables one by one as you went, as, that went, or as, the, as, as the cables that were carrying information from. Canada and Nova Scotia to Europe were broken. There was communication loss. And so what we assumed was there was a big slump that had occurred off the slope that had cut one cable after another in sequence. And there was several of them. So they could work out how 
fast the stump is moving, that 100 miles an hour, and, and, and you know, how far it went into the, into the deep abyssal plane. And of course, this was one of the processes we call it to be the current, current B stage, right? But a big one, because it was really deposited a whole heap of sediments. And we, they went back and looked at that, and sure enough, there was a layer of sand and silk sitting at the top of those cores with ooze underneath. And that was the grand match, earthquake uh, slump, you might call it. Right? So they went ahead then, Hazen and Tharp, and continued to map using the same system as they'd always used. Ocean tracks from all over the world, from the British and the French, and uh, <coughs> put together the first floor of the ocean map. Physiographic diagram, but no, it's just there isn't a redrawing of the little hills in, right? And the flat plains and everything by hand. And that was published in National Geographic bang, in the 90s. It's interesting because Hazen went to Moscow, he was invited by the Russian scientists. And they thought he just made the whole thing up. No, they're really serious. You can't say all this. You know, what are you doing? You know, this is not right. How do you know this? How do you know that? Well, of course, we know what happened after that. It was that was when they'd finished the Atlantic Ocean that he went over there and then he continued to do it. As you can see, it's not a bad diagram of what we know is going on today, considering it was done by hand. It's really spectacular, really, when you think about it. So I uh, just an example, one of the things I did with Morris Ewing. The deepest part of the North Atlantic Ocean is the Puerto Rico Trench. And one of the things that Ewing said to me was, how would you like to work in the Puerto Rico Trench? I said, terrific. I said, can we get a sequence of calls down the floor of the Puerto Rico Trench, all taken at the same, by the same ship, one after another? So we know the floors are one or two kilometers of sediments in it, but the most recent upper part of that sedimentary pile, we should be able to correlate the turbidity current sediments by looking at the color of the clay fraction. Because the color of the clay fraction is very sensitive. It's something we found out in the lab, I think. And the colors were subtle, but if we had totally fresh pores, and if they were put in the fridge, and we opened them all at once back at Lamont, we would be able to correlate the sequence of events, which is in fact what we did. So this with the Puerto Rico trenches in red. It's the deepest part of the Atlantic. And there's another physiographic diagram showing Puerto Rico and the main trench floor, a bit orange there on the left, you can see that. And the series of cores taken leading into the main abyssal plain, which is the orange section, from the continental margin northwards from Puerto Rico. I went down to San Juan, we studied the shelf sediments. Oh, it was a bit of a boondoggle, but it was kind of fun. And at the same time, I remember it very well because at that time, the French had its sister submersible, the Archimede, Archimede base there looking at the bottom of the ocean floor. It had another ship that was about a ship, about a state called the Trieste. So the Trieste and the Archimed, both made in the 60s, were making circles around the earth and doing deep geology and measurements and photography in the deep past. So the French were there, the Conrad was there, and I was there. <laughs> I was lucky to watch all that. And when she got to work on the Puerto Rico Trench, here we are looking at the cores when we finally got them back. And here they are, a whole sequence of cores, Conrad 9. Here we are with one Vima core thrown in the middle. 
for fun. And what we had was a light olive gray label, another light olive gray, but the olive grays were different when you opened them up. There were subtle color changes. What happens when you open up the cores and split them, you stick them in those trays, put them in the lab, they all dry out. And they all become light olive gray then. And you can't tell one from another. So, so we were looking at the fresh ones and we were able to correlate these subtle color changes along the trench floor, which is a win the way we saw it. Of course, uh, and here they are along the trench floor, Conrad 40, and as you can see there, and it's, we did the sand fractions and things, but that didn't tell you all that much. The important thing was that, that there was more sand in 43 than there was in, you know, some of the others. Obviously, there was more clay and silt in the ones that were more distal, like 38 and 39, far less sand. But this is the top of the core. This showed evidence of one flooding event, basically. The one at the top of the core. Must have been a big one. I don't know what caused it, but it could have been any number of things from earthquakes to slumps to things triggered by earthquakes. And this is, you know, this is me doing my sedimentary petrology, showing how as you get further and further away from, from the one on the right, increasing transport distance, you get obviously <laughs> more pteropods, more global gerina, foraminifera, and less rock fragments and minerals. You know, showing us, you know, it's a, it's a one big episode and getting with finer grain material in the distal margins. And this is just some of the sand. Uh, it doesn't look like much on these photographs. You really need color. But I was fiddling with this stuff, and they're really what we're dealing here is a whole bunch of different rock fragments and bits and pieces of uh, corals and God knows what that the slumps and the turbidity kind of collected on their way down into the trench floor. You really do need a color photograph to that. And now, just to mention something else, uh, recent work, 2018, 27,480 feet, first human to die to the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean, which is this guy, Fiskogo. Right, there he is with his submersible uh, going to the deepest part, of course, the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean. Little note at the bottom, you hear Conley, for the first humans to correlate to really currents for deep sea course, i.e. Puerto Rico Trench. You know? Now, back to Australia. I came back there after spending a couple, two or three years over there and was interested in doing stuff here, of course. You know, getting out the Ecosoni records from the Australian Hydrographic Guys, lying them down along the corridor at Sydney University Geology Department. Uh, Doing the mapping from the original Echo Sandy records, which we did, which was I did. And sure enough, we wrote some papers of various kinds. And there's just a map there showing some of the locations of the core material. It's widely spaced, you know, but um, you can see the C9s, Conrad, you see the Vima 18s, right? There it is in that part. This is the only data we had uh, at the time from that part of the Tasman Sea. And I wrote a paper about the Western Tasman Sea for making a bathymetric map and a physiographic map using the old track records, you know, in the old fashioned style, and looked at the various cores. Now they, these cores are representative of a whole heap of different sediments. Uh, just to the South East, there's a Conrad 9132, I think it is. And I think that was a good one because that went through some Dobu stuff and went into manganese pavement. There's a big manganese pavement over there, which is buried by a manganese nodding. A huge thing, which was later mapped by one of my graduate students, uh, southwest of, southeast of Tasmania. Quite interesting, in fact. You know, something about the deep ocean floor, you can find all kinds of things. Anyway, so we ended up doing work like that. 
And today, what's going on? Well, today we have our own ship, Silo runs it, uh, the investigator. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than the Vima. <laughs> it's probably what you'd use these days. Instead of being 200 foot long, it's 300 foot long. Instead of being a couple of thousand tons, it's more like four or five. Uh, but it's got all the right goodies on it. I was talking to a colleague of mine called Bronwyn Davies. I don't know where you know Bronwyn. Uh, she's worked more recently in Kina at the time. PMG, I was involved with them up there, doing a lot of work recently before they shut us down with COVID. Uh, but uh, Bronwyn tells me that it's got three different quarrying systems on it from gravity to piston to something else that I didn't understand. It's got all the bells and whistles. And so it's our first really state-of-the-art research vessel. Good old Aussie, we're out there doing some things. So that's about all I've got to say. I mean, Hazen was a character. I mean, he loved to work hard and play hard. He died, unfortunately, of a stroke, which is what he probably was going to do anyway at the age of 53, while in a submarine on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Mm. And when he was 53 years old, 1977, I went to his funeral. We were living over there when in, our, in the 70s. And there were lots of people there. Ewing died like a normal person at the end of his late 60s and those days in, in his hometown near Rice, and Rice University in Texas. Both two amazing people. Ewing, the director with a broad picture. Hazen, the farmer with a, an immense geological knowledge and know-how and a hard worker. And it was just so nice to have those memories because we learned what it was like. We worked hard here, but when we got over there, it was 24-7. There wasn't any stopping. You know, there was, what do you mean you're going to go play cricket or something? <laughs> But it, what are you doing, you know? So uh, it was a different scene and one that stays with you for the rest of your life. And I was very lucky to have that opportunity. So I have questions, please. Right, anyone have any questions? Yes, get back. Yeah, thanks, John. It's very interesting. You, you haven't mentioned anything about the Ewing Eisen split or argument between their falling out. Or I guess, uh, oh, Ewing Hazen? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I worked with David Needham, who was South African from Cape Town, and he was into all that stuff, and he said he was going to write a book about it. <laughs> and I and I, you know, I was too busy doing geology. I said, well, what's the, I mean, it was obvious that Ewing lived in Lamont Hall and was the director. But before very long, he had cut off Hazen from all the money that he got. So Hazen had to go out and get his own funding for himself and his graduate students from some other situation. So they, they ran into each other full speed. I don't know what caused it. That was competitive. Hazen was soon got the funding. And, and Ewing was without students, you know. He had, a, he had me and he had David Needham as postdoctoral fellows, but we worked a lot with both those chaps. He wasn't, I don't, my gut feel is he wasn't very well in those days, right? He, you know, he, he had the prostate cancer. You know, it's just, it's one of those things, right? Hazen, being much younger, uh, was out there doing, oh, making maps. He wouldn't tell Ewing what he was doing. If Ewing was a director of the observatory, and all of a sudden, bingo, there'd be a map with the Geological Observatory. I'm sure if somebody in his department would have showed it to him, but I'm not quite sure how they did that or whether Hazen just went out and did it anyway. And my guess is a bit of a boat went on there because they were quite autonomous and they never wrote anything together, uh, which is a shame because they were both very good scientists. But I don't know. I mean, who knows what the real answer to that is? I don't know. 
I just know whether they have quite different personalities. I mean, Ewing was Ewing was kind of a class act, you know, polite, gentlemanly, all that stuff. Rice University. I think was wild. You know, <laughs> he was there, man. He was freaking bloody martinis at six. I come down to our house and we'll finish the that. First thing we've got to do is have these martinis, right? Put them all out and big glasses and thumbs, and then we better have some steak. Oh, we forgot the cook. That's too bad. Just eat it, right? And that was that was nice, right? He was out there, totally different personality. But very, very good geologist and, and living life to the full. I mean, when he died, he was only 53. It was a great loss, I thought. You know, well, he basically killed himself by eating and drinking too much and working too hard. That's the way I look at it. Probably didn't take any pills like they do today. That way we're still alive, you know. We haven't even thought about it. Sorry, we have one more question. Yeah. John, I thought that was a really interesting presentation. And it, it strikes me that in terms of the history of earth sciences, you guys were in the right place at the right time to witness some really exciting discoveries. Uh, my question is that it, it seems to me as though you were in quite a similar position to Marie Clark in the sense that um, when you arrived, you had these 2,000 cores that were all in the room, unexplored. Similarly, you know, women weren't allowed out on the boat, so she, she's given all of these soundings to map. And perhaps some of the most exciting moments might have been when you were sitting at the tail end of what most people see as the exciting process of doing earth sciences in the sense that they've done the adventurous stuff out on the ships and collected the data. And I wonder if you could just share some thoughts about was that an exciting moment for you discovering, you know, the sort of clues of say those North Atlantic ports and the place you were deposits in them and what that meant in terms of our understanding. Well, I mean, all of what you say is correct. I eventually uh, got a professorship in marine geology at the University of South Carolina. And then I was then able to also be the chief. So, and then I would apply for grants to run a vessel called the RV Eastwood, which was out of North Carolina. So I used to take my graduate students, back when we were first married, and I was similar, we went on a 10 day cruise, and I was a chief scientist. We had the funding, we had the Vima, the uh, Eastwood had all the devices. But Eastwood was actually designed by Hazen. And, and it was basically a winch and water. And, and it was a huge 10 kilometer, same as still paper tent, same as winch, so we could take deep cores and things like with another winch on the other side of the ship for camera work. So yeah, I I was able to use go to see myself with my own graduate students later on, you know, and kind of repeat in some form or other what I've seen, which I was data I was working on, but I've never been seen with them. So I mean, see, I, we did go to see it. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether that answers your question or not. Well, I suppose what I was thinking was that I know that we've got a field store that's full of cores that we have to persuade our graduate students to go and have a look at from time to time. And uh, I think that there are exciting moments to be had in that store, looking through those cores. Uh, similarly, there are exciting moments to be had in the GIS lab, looking at you know soundings later. And you know we can talk about martinis and uh, you know, oh, yeah. hearing and whatnot. But actually, when you look, I suppose through history, some of the most exciting moments and looking at the data and going, oh, the, the eureka moment that this is what's happening. There's no doubt about that because subsequent to my so sojourn at Le Mans. I went to LSU and looked at the Mississippi Delta. Then I went and spent four months at Scripps in the Hoya. And they wanted me, I got a consultant job. They wanted me to look at every call they'd taken in the Indian Ocean in four months. So I had a Kelly girl, which I used to talk to, piping things up. I had a guy that used to do the sand fraction. I had somebody else making smear slides so I could look at the fine fraction and down a binocular microscope. And I was flat chat. But fantastic things happened while I was doing that because I remember looking at the sand fraction all of a sudden, what am I looking at? These little spherical globules wide right? roll across the slide in front of my microscope. Little tectites they were. And they were the tectites from that 
asteroid or whatever it was that hit that part of the Indian Ocean and left a splay of these glass beads all over the seafloor. And they were always at, about at the Brutus Matsuama boundary, 700,000 years ago. So that was exciting. You know, I don't know how much has been written about that, but almost invariably, there were a lot of little globules that came out. So that was an exciting moment. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, very, that's a great talk, John. My, my first oceanographic voyage was on the eastward, so I enjoyed the, the revisit of that. Um, Naomi Oscar wrote a book, uh, Science on a Mission. And her, uh, the, the, center, the main point of that book was that the work that uh, Ewing and, and Hazen did was primarily funded by the Navy. And there was Trump. a close relationship between the Navy and the science could do and what they couldn't do. Could they say something about the and, uh, Yeah, there was obviously things that they couldn't publish. I mean, I mean, I was working on one of those projects on the Mid Atlantic, which I only dealt with the state and tore it back. And the, you're right, there were US Navy funded projects that where they got the data and nobody else got it. But just how much. Of that was going on, I was never sure, but there would have been some. Yeah. Um, sorry, John, but we've got another we got a school meeting uh, coming up. It's in another room. So, yeah. Right. Thank you, John, again. But thank you very much. Okay. We'll we'll catch up again yeah. later. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Later being. Um, some other time, some other time. Okay, yeah. thanks. All right. Terrific. Thank okay. you.